May the words of my mouth and meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Today we have a double dose of the prophet Isaiah continuing our ongoing uh, conversation and uh, the themes of the prophets being who are guiding our paths as we move toward the end of our liturgical year. Yes, New Year's Eve is near upon us. Next Sunday is the last Sunday of the church year. We will turn our faces into a new season of preparation as Advent begins on the 1st of December. And remember the prophets are charged not so much with telling the future, but speaking the word of God, speaking the will of God and the dreams of God into reality for the community. This is especially true for Isaiah, as Isaiah's community is a, one, is a community that is in exile. First with the Babylonians, and then ultimately returned to the Holy Land, to Jerusalem, uh, by the Persians, by King Cyrus, who commands that the city of Jerusalem be rebuilt after the sacking of Jerusalem. This is a community of people who have had some very high highs with the establishment of the kingdom of Judah, the kingdom of Israel, the glory days of King David and King Solomon, though, are but a distant memory for the people. And it is tough for them to hang on to anything that resembles hope for the future because their understanding of what it meant to be the chosen people of God and to be established in a place with a nation and a particular strength seems to have evaporated. The timing of the celebration of new ministry that we will have with the bishop at, at uh, 10.30 is an interesting timing in ju juxtaposition with the fact that we had a funeral in this space yesterday afternoon, where we celebrated the life of Elizabeth Barber, uh, and where we laid claim to the promises that Jesus not only gave to us by his word and his example, but lived for us and died for us and rose again for us to give us reasons for hope in the midst of some very, at least apparently hopeless situations. It's hard for the people of Israel, uh, the kingdom of Judah, to imagine that everything is going to be okay again. But in the words of Julian of Norwich, the 13th century mystic, all shall be well, and in all manner of things, all shall be well. That doesn't mean everything's all beard skittles right now. It's just that God will work God, God's purposes out. And as we have the benefit of knowing the end of the story before it's all told in the liturgy, we know that the ultimate end of the Bible is that God wins. And if God wins, so do we. It might help us to reformulate what our notion of winning is. <coughs> We live in a highly competitive society. And if you don't believe that, I'll fight you over it. That's, that's a little joke, really more than a joke. <laughs> we, we fight about some of the most uh, mundane things, and I mean that in the, the sense of worldly things. But it seems to me that the prophet is saying in this morning's early reading, uh, that we can put that aside, that we can trust in the fact that God will win, and that God makes a specialty of pulling opposites together. I've served some diverse churches. Uh, when I served at St. Mark's in, in Hampton, uh, a very diverse church, socioeconomically. Um, we were about half black and half white in the congregation, about a half gay and half straight in the congregation. People who would not normally gather together coalesced around the gospel, the good news of God in Christ. And at first glance, St. Thomas is a much more homogenous group of folks. But that's just at first glance. If we try and figure out by looking at folks who they are, we can make assumptions about people that are inaccurate and ultimately unhelpful for the nature of community. The diversity that we share is one 
that I think can be an example to the world in our day and time that is important and not so obvious. I know in having conversations with a number of folks that our beliefs and our uh, practice spans the gamut politically. And yet there is something about the gospel that brings us all together. <laughs> brings us all together here and allows the possibility of genuine dialogue and conversation to unfold around a deeply held truth that God is God and that we are God. And that there is no person that exists on the face of this earth that I cannot learn some of something from. It is only when we come to any kind of relationship with the vulnerability to, to be hurt and to have our views challenged that we can grow into anything like the glory of God that's reflected in the promises that Isaiah gives in the reading for today and that we lay claim to as followers of Jesus Christ. We not, need not be of like mind to have the same heart in us. And it is a heart that Ezekiel the prophet said God longs to put in us, that Joel said that God longs to put in us, to take out our heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. I was reminded of uh, the juxtaposition between life and death and resurrection yesterday and what we celebrate as the people of God here every Sunday. As I heard the first part of the Old Testament reading, or the funeral yesterday. And it starts in uh, Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22. says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, so is my soul. Therefore, I will have hope in him. To have hope is the necessary condition of a life lived for the kingdom of God. And if, as Isaiah says, that God is about to create a new heaven and a new earth, we should be hopeful people. We should put our hope in God and God's purposes, which are at most confounding and at least a wee bit mysterious for those of us who see only with the dimensional eyes of humanity and not with the divine foresight of the longer arc of the narrative between God and his people. And I thought that was a strange text to lead off with, especially in the book that's called Lamentations. There's not a whole lot of lamenting that goes on in that particular verse. So I backed up to verse 19. The thought of my affliction and my hopelessness is wormwood and gall. My soul continually thinks of it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have and then goes on to proclaim that the steadfast love of God never ceases. Regardless of our apparent circumstances, the ultimate reality that we live in as people chosen by God for the building of the kingdom of God is that we are marinated in hope. We are marinated in the hope that is God's love for us. In seminary, we were required for ordination to have a certain competency in one biblical language. I chose Greek, so I will share with you the only Hebrew word that I know with any confidence, and it is chesed. Chesed, C-H-E-S-E-D, -E -E, the steadfast love of God. A love that tells us that as the people of God, we will get it wrong, and God will not love us less. We'll do wonderful things with the power of the Holy Spirit and the guiding light of Jesus before us. And God won't love us anymore. That the love that God has for us individually and as a community is everlasting from before time and forever. <coughs> and as intense as it's ever going to get in the now. So as we turn our eyes and our hearts and our hands and our feet toward the future of what God has called us to do together. I pray that we keep in mind that our hope is in God. 
our constant confession is that God is God and that we're not. And that the only thing we need to do to have hope is to change our thinking as they did in Lamentation. Thinking of our thoughts and our afflictions and our homelessness leads to inevitable sadness. And we can ask the question in the bad stuff that inevitably will happen to us in life, why me? And that's entirely appropriate. But I think the balance that keeps us in rhythm as a community of faith and as individuals seeking the will of God and pursuing the execution of that will is that we ask the why me question equally as much in the face of blessing. Perhaps the question in the midst of our challenges is not so much why me, but why not me? And the question in the midst of our blessings is, Lord, what is it that you do, what we have we done that you consider us so much? To quote Psalm 8, what is man that you are mindful of them? What are human beings that you care for them? We are the very creation that God is in relationship with in order to create the new heavens and the new earth that Isaiah prophesies in what we heard today. And Jesus is the incarnate example of how we will do that, learning to give up what is most dear to us and being given the glory of God in return. So I invite us to make the trade of our will, our plan for our lives and for the life of the world Trade that into God and open our hands to receive the blessing that God has to give for us. Hope for a new creation, a new Jerusalem, one that is steeped in joy and gives hope to all people, regardless of who they are, where they've come from, or where they think they may be born. May we as the people of God rise up, reflecting the glory of God into the world, and say with quiet confidence, that the Lord indeed is our portion, and our, we will hope in Him from this day forward and forevermore.